In this video I'll take a look at an old tube radio, the Zenith G725. An example of an early FM radio, we'll look at its features, demonstrated operating, and take a look at the circuitry inside. The Zenith Radio Company was founded in 1918 and was one of the most well-known manufacturers of radios, televisions, and eventually computers. They were famous for their transoceanic line of high-end, high-performance, portable shortwave radios. At one time they had over 11,000 employees and in 1979 Zenith purchased the Heathkit Company. However, by the late 1980s they were going through hard times and went through a number of different acquisitions. Today the company lives on as part of LG Electronics. FM or frequency modulation is a method of encoding information such as voice on a radio signal by varying the instantaneous frequency of the carrier wave. It offers a number of advantages over amplitude modulation, which is also commonly used. Edwin Armstrong invented the modern method of frequency modulation and held some key patents. There was a large patent dispute between Armstrong and RCA, which he eventually lost and likely was a factor in his death by suicide. Zenith established one of the very first FM radio stations in the U.S. in 1940 and one of the earliest FM multiplex stereo stations in 1961. While there was some FM broadcasting in the 1930s, the modern 88 to 108 megahertz FM band was created in 1945, but was not very popular until the upsurge in high fidelity equipment in the late 1950s. The Zenith radio model G725 dates from the 1950 model year. Following Zenith's convention of separately numbering radios in their chassis, the chassis is 7G01. Schematic diagrams for the radio can be found in Ryder's Perpetual Troubleshooters Manual, Volume 21, and in Bateman's Most Often Needed Radio Diagrams for 1950. The G725 is a larger than average AM FM table radio with a brown bakelite case. It's a relatively early model for FM, which is mono only and has no AFC. It uses seven tubes plus a selenium rectifier in the power supply. It has a very attractive large dial in the center. The six and a half inch speaker is mounted behind the tuning dial. A knob in the center of the tuning indicator is a tone control, and it has a carrying handle on the top, although it's not portable and would be quite a large radio to carry around. The radio has a nice Art Deco look to it, and like many Zenith radios, it's considered a classic, both for its appearance and its electrical performance. The left and right sides each have two concentric controls. The inner left dial selects between AM and FM operation, and the case is marked Standard Broadcast and FM 100. This is to distinguish it from the older pre-war 42 to 50 MHz FM band, which was by that time obsolete. The outer dial is tuning, which uses a dial cord to provide a vernier function and to drive the center dial pointer. On the right side, both the inner and outer knobs are the on-off and volume control. Both knobs turn the same shaft. The second one is purely there for aesthetics to match the knobs on the left side. In the center is the large tuning dial marked with AM frequencies from 55 to 160 on the top half and FM from 88 to 108 in the lower half. The center of the tuning knob is a tone control, a function which is easy to overlook as a decoration. On the rear panel are two terminals for the optional FM antenna and ground. Note the sticker on the back which says FM, the Armstrong system licensed under Armstrong patents. The back cover also has writing on it which is almost impossible to make out as it's in faded silver paint. On the bottom is a sticker partially missing which has the model and other information including the tube layout and patent numbers. The Bakelite case has a piece missing on the back, but it's not very visible. Let's hear a demonstration of the unit operating. 
I've turned it on a few minutes ago and allowed it to warm up. Let's first listen to AM. That's a great story there of getting the interception caught in your face mask. White Bank and Leitrim. We also have Iris east of Green Bank, Baseline east of Green Bank, also Fern Bank at Eagleson, Riverside at Hanks Lane, and Sound Run northbound of Barack. And now on FM. Is heavy from the Vanier Parkway to Bayshore. Good travel time to Smith Falls. That's the jingle bell ride. Jingle bell. The radio has quite good sound, thanks in part to the large speaker. The sound quality is noticeably better on FM than AM. It's quite sensitive on FM, even with no external antenna. Tuning on FM is somewhat critical because there's no AFC or automatic frequency control a feature that modern FM radios have that keeps the radio automatically tuned to stations. The radio uses a pretty standard design with a metal chassis and large components like tubes, filter capacitors, and IF transformers mounted on top of the chassis. The tube lineup is the following. A 12BA6 RF amplifier, 12AT7 converter, 12 BA6 first IF amplifier and 12 BA6 second IF amplifier, 12 AU6 limiter for FM only, 19 T6 discriminator for FM or detector for AM, and first audio amplifier, it's a dual tube, and a 35 B5 audio power amplifier. The tube heaters are in series and add up to 114 volts, which means today's typical 120 volts is a little high. At the time, 117 volts was probably average, and the line voltage could be as low as 110 volts in some areas. The speaker is a 6.5 inch round permanent magnet type. The dial lamp is neon, and it shines through a small plastic jewel next to the power volume knob. It's an unusual neon bulb, the same size as the typical number 47 incandescent lamp, and installed in a socket. FM tuning uses variable inductors mechanically connected to the same variable capacitor used for AM tuning. A cam moves the cores in and out of the coils. The two dial cords between the tuning knob, tuning cap, and inductors in tuning dial are quite complex. Mounted on the tuning dial in the center of the speaker is the tone control. The tone control works by using feedback from the speaker circuit back to the audio amplifier. One side of the AC line is connected to the chassis, so one has to be very careful working on it to avoid getting a dangerous shock. It's recommended, and the service information mentions this, to use an isolation transformer like this when working on it outside of the case. This scheme is still potentially quite dangerous because if a user was to remove a knob, for example, there's a 50-50 chance that the metal shaft would be connected to the live AC line, depending on which way it was plugged into an outlet. At least it has an interlock so that removing the back panel disconnects the power cord. Underneath the chassis, it uses pretty standard point-to-point -point wiring. The circuit is a little more complex than for the typical 5-tube AM radio. The 100 MHz FM frequency range was pushing what could be done with tubes in this kind of wiring. That may have been the reason that one side of the chassis was connected to the AC line, to get better grounding and shielding. Most AM radios by this time no longer had a hot chassis. The schematic says it uses a selenium rectifier, but this unit has a silicon diode. It's a rather strange one that fits into a fuse holder. I suspect the original selenium unit was replaced at some point because the associated dropping resistor was also changed from 22 to 30 ohms to compensate for the lower voltage drop of a silicon diode. This is a good change, as selenium rectifiers, like this one, are prone to failure after a number of years and can release a bad smell and toxic fumes. 
The design is quite impressive in the way it implements AM and FM with only a few switching changes to the circuit. The unusual IF transformers are wired for both 455 kHz for AM and 10.7 MHz for FM so they can do double duty. AM reception uses a standard coil antenna. Zenith like to call these a wave magnet. FM can use an external antenna and ground, or when the jumper wire is connected, it uses the AC power line as the antenna via a coupling capacitor. I bought this radio on eBay in January of 2007. The radio more or less worked as received when it was briefly powered up. I put on a new line cord, replaced some rubber covered wire, and replaced all the electrolytic and paper capacitors. At some point, a new electrolytic cap had been paralleled in with the old one, not a good practice. It was tricky to get at some of the paper caps, there were 12 in all. One was a black beauty type that some guitar amps and audiophiles swear by. It showed high leakage when tested on my leakage tester. When cleaning the case, a lot of brown color came off. Some brown is normal, but this amount likely indicated that it had been exposed to tobacco smoke for some time. I didn't align the radio because it was working well and some of the components were sealed in place. I may run through the align procedure in the future. It's covered in the service information, and FM alignment only requires an unmodulated signal generator and AC voltmeter. You can find many examples of the Zenith G725 on the internet. Despite being 65 years old, this radio still works today and is compatible with current FM stereo broadcasts. It uses the same IF frequency and same basic design as most modern FM radio receivers, although today an FM radio can now be integrated into a single chip which sells for less than a dollar. I've also made YouTube videos on the Zenith Transoceanic H500 and the Zenith 8S563 console radio. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out my other YouTube videos on vintage electronics.